And I invite you to open to our text for tonight, uh, Revelation chapter 4. It's page 1751 in the Pew Bible, if you have that in front of you. Revelation chapter 4. As we are continuing through this strange and wonderful book, I'm going to read the whole chapter, but don't worry, it's just 11 verses. So well, you can read along with me. Revelation chapter 4, page 1751. In the Pew Bible, Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 1. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. And surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders, and they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also, in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, and the second was like an ox, and the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This is the word of God. Well, I'd ask you to, in starting thinking about this text, think for just a moment about some of the hardest things you've ever had to do. Do you have that in mind? Some of the, the, the hardest thing or the hardest things you've ever had to do. It might be a, a physical challenge of some sort. Uh, maybe you've run an Ironman if you're not doing this one. Uh, it may be a hard season at work, a, a change in your life that you had to make, it was very hard to make, um, a painful loss, a struggle with disease, whatever this was. Uh, think of the hardest thing you ever had to do, and now I want you to imagine that you have the opportunity to speak to somebody who's about to go through a similar path. They're about to go through the, the same kind of thing, and you want to encourage them. You, in fact, want to put some steel in their spine. You want to strengthen them to go through it. Uh, what would you say? Uh, what would you talk about? What subject would you want to talk about? Uh, here, here's something that is important to understand about this immensely strange and wonderful book called the book of Revelation uh, in our Bible, the, the book we've started into this summer. Uh, this book was written to real churches. Before it ever came to us, it had a first audience, the church uh, a series of churches uh, in the late first century. And you can see those churches are addressed in the beginning of the book. That's what we've been looking in for the last several weeks. Seven letters to seven churches. These are real churches. The letter was to them before it ever came to us. And the churches that were addressed, you can see this in the seven letters. These churches had undergone persecution. If you're noticing these, following along in these letters, you've seen this. They'd undergone persecution and they would be facing more in the days ahead. Uh, and that's why in every one of the letters to the churches, Jesus ends the letter. Do you remember how he ends it? Uh, he ends it at the very end with, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit's saying to the churches. But before that, there's a promise to the one who is victorious. 
or to the one who overcomes, depending on your translation. In other words, to the one who, in the trouble that is coming, will stand firm and emerge through the trial and the trouble that's coming victorious. Every one of the letters has that call because every one of these churches in time was going to face, and this is historical reality in the first three centuries of the church, was going to face hardship, persecution. And Jesus is talking to them, and he wants to encourage them, and he wants to put steel in the church's spine. He wants to strengthen them to stand through it. He wants to strengthen us too. So it's going to be hard. What does Jesus say to the churches? Where does he start? He moves now from the seven letters. It's Jesus who invites John and with John, the seven, all of these churches and with those churches, all of us to now look at something and here's what Jesus wants to show him to encourage us, to strengthen us, to help us stand through the hardest things that might come. He brings us into a worship service. The thing Jesus wants to talk about first is worship. Is that surprising? That's where he starts. Worship. Uh, Jesus says, Jesus shows us, the whole rest of the book of Revelation keys off of these four chapters, chapters four and five, which are all about worship in heaven. That's where it starts. That's the first thing Jesus wants to show us. You want steel in your spine? Worship God. You want to be encouraged through hard times? Regularly worship God. That's where it starts. Uh, and by the way, did you know that here you are, you're, you're in church on a Saturday night and it's like 80 degrees. I mean, you believe this. Uh, but do you know uh, even that there is statistical uh, uh, backing for this? Tyler Vanderweer, who of uh, Harvard University Public Health, in the Harvard University Public Health Journal of this last April, uh, 2024, uh, published uh, results of his, seri his uh, survey of a whole bunch of surveys of people who regularly worship in a church. And he says these surveys are, are extensive. 215 studies of the health effects of regularly worshiping. 215 studies, over 1,000 participants, longitudinal data. In other words, the best kind of research. And here's what it shows. I'm count, quoting uh, Dr. Vanderweer of, of Harvard University Public Health. He says, um, all of these surveys were used to evaluate the relationship between religion and health. And the surveys... Uh, the documentation suggests that weekly religious service attendance is longitudinally associated with, okay, here's the big thing, here's associated with, lower mortality risk, lower depression, less suicide, better cardiovascular disease survival, better health behaviors, and greater, greater marital stability, happiness, and purpose in life. Going to church is good for you. You can tell that when you invite your friend to come next, next week. It's good for you. It actually strengthens you. It actually makes you resilient. You can measure this. Uh, in fact, uh, the same uh, is true on, a, on the other side. Uh, Dr. Vanderweer goes on to say not going to church can be correlated with a lot of other things. Uh, not going to regular worship. Uh, he says the data suggests that about the 40% uh, of the increasing suicide rate in the United States from 1999 to 2014 may be attributed to declines in attendance in religious services during this period. And uh, it accounted for 28% of the increase in depression among adolescents. In other words, he's saying as religious attendance is going down, suicide and depression is going up. The statistics suggest those are correlated. And here Jesus, speaking to churches that are about to go into hard stuff, says, here's where you want to start. Worship. Regular worship. And he takes them and us into the strangest, most worship, wonderful worship service you've ever imagined it. Here's, here's what I hope we're going to see tonight about worship. Uh, three, three things. Uh, this text, chapter 4, which really goes with chapter 5, but we're only talking about chapter 4 tonight. This chapter shows us worship's structure, it's the, the building blocks of it, the structure of worship, its scope, and its sustaining power. Three things. I'll move through them with you. The simple structure. And here's the simple structure. 
Look at it with me. The simple structure, well, I'll just tell you what it is, and then I'll show you it in the text. The simple structure, it has a very simple structure, two building blocks that go in order. This is the definition of worship throughout the Bible, I believe, and in this chapter. Here's what worship is. God reveals his glory. His people respond in worship. It's really simple, but really important. In that order, God reveals his glory. His people respond with worship. God reveals his people respond. Cause and effect. Like the hitter smashes the home run, the crowd goes wild. The band starts into their greatest hits, the crowd goes wild, right? The food goes on the table, and it's good. And the people eat, and they say, hmm, this is good. You know what I'm saying? Cause and effect. God reveals his glory. His people respond in worship. That order is right here in the text, and it's really important to healthy worship. It's right here in the text. Let me just show you, uh, he, show you it here. Look at chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. This is right after the letter to the seventh church. Uh, and John says this, After this I looked, and it's this astonishing vision. And there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Now, how, did, how does the door to heaven get open? You may remember a few weeks ago in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said, I hold the key of David. I can open a door no one can shut, and I can shut a door no one can open. Here Jesus is opening the door. I said, what he does is, what this means, the key of David is that Jesus is the Messiah who can open the door into the kingdom of God, and that's what he does. He's opened the door here for John to come through, and for us with him to come through into the heaven, into heaven, and to get a glimpse, a strange and wonderful glimpse of what is going on in what we cannot see. The door in heaven is open, and he says, come up and come in. Look at, uh, I heard the first, the voice of one speaking to me like a trumpet. That's Jesus from earlier. And Jesus says, come up here, and I will show you what must take place. Uh, the whole starting point for the whole thing is Jesus has got to open the door and show us the glory of God because you can't see it uh, with your natural eyes. God's got to show it to you. In fact, you can't see and know the glory and the goodness of God without God telling you who he is. He has to reveal his glory first so we can know him. That's actually not different. I've said this before, but it's actually not different than any other relationship. Have you ever been in a good, close relationship? Some of you, yes, many of you. Have you ever tried to guess what the person you're in a close relationship with is thinking? Any of you? Has that worked well 100% of the time? I, some of you are being honest and you're shaking your head no. Now, I, that, it is very dangerous to look, it's very dangerous for me right now to look at all of you and guess what you're thinking. I don't know what you're thinking. You don't know what even your spouse is thinking until they tell you. How could we figure out who God is and what he's doing? We can see the evidence of who he is in creation all around us. Evidence that there is a God. But what is that God like? The only way we know is if he opens the door and says, come in. If he speaks and tells us, this is who I am. Revelation, God reveals his glory. He opens the door, and then his people respond in worship. Same pattern is happening at this strange and wonderful worship service in heaven. Look down at verse 6 to 9. There's weird stuff here. I'm going to keep saying that. I'll, we'll talk more about what this symbolism means later. But verses 6 through 9, you have these creatures around the throne of God. Uh, you have 24 elders, which uh, in this case... In this text, I think, means these are like some kind of uh, angelic authorities. I think that's what most people would think. Some kind of angelic host, like the Scripture talks about. These 24 elders, the numbers may be symbolic. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. Old Testament, New Testament. And, well, this is, what, this is apocalyptic literature. It's full of numbers and symbols and signs. In any event, you have these authorities in heaven, these elders, 24 of them, probably angelic hosts. And then in the middle, uh, you have four living creatures. Come back to talk about these strange creatures later. But watch what happens, what the four living creatures and the 24 elders who are 24 elders all sitting on smaller thrones with crowns. And there's this pattern you see of worship that happens around the throne of God in which revelation is proclaimed and then the people respond. So look at verse 8. Each of the four living creatures... Uh, was, had six wings, was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying. Notice they're proclaiming 
Here's the truth. Here's the word of God. They proclaim it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He proclaims the glory. They proclaim the glory of God. And what happens when they do? Revelation of God's glory. Verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they sing their own song. You see the pattern. Revelation, this is who God is. He lets us in. He opens our eyes. Response, we respond. The hitter hits a home run. The crowd roars. The, 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 the band starts to play the song. The crowd starts to sing. The food is on the table. You eat it. This is good. You respond. God says, here is who I am. And the people of God say, praise the Lord. They give thanks. They worship. They respond. Now, why is that important? Why is that simple pattern important? Because this shapes, this simple structure of worship, this, worship, this simple structure is essential to healthy worship if you're going to faithfully worship uh, because uh, it should shape what happens every time we gather, even on a Saturday night. Uh, because in this way, uh, what drives worship? What drives a really good worship service? Our feelings... What drives a really good worship? Our style preferences? What's happening in the world? What happened this week? No, the revelation of God's glory. We come in and we are reminded wherever we're coming from, this is who God is. Every week, Lord willing, every week. That's why we read the scripture. That's why we have a call to worship at the beginning. That's why we read the scripture throughout. That's why we pick songs that reflect what God has said about who he is. That's why we spend time looking at the scripture in order to remember this is who God is. This is what he's done. So that in response to that, we can reorder everything else in our lives and respond to God on the basis of who he is with lives of worship and singing. That order, God reveals, we come back. This is against the tide of the way our culture increasingly thinks. In fact, the way most of our culture thinks. Today, this structure is not how we think about spirituality generally. People today generally think, and, and this influences all of us, it's not just some people, they generally think that, what is, that real, authentic spirituality is what's going on in here. What I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, I'm looking within myself to connect with the inner divine spark. I'm looking into where I'm at and what, what's authentic for me. And it's not out there, it's in here. Have you ever heard people talk like that? I can tell you I've been interviewing for the last few weeks a lot of people who are not regularly part of worship service. And this is very much the way people think about worship. It cues off of what is in here uh, and goes from in here to out there, but the structure of biblical worship is entirely different. It doesn't start with, and it often doesn't comport with, it's not exactly lined up with who we are when we come in. We might come in sad, but we are reminded in worship of something that's outside of us, God. And you know what? That is an incredibly healthy thing. I was uh, reading about the, the poet, Mary Carr. I don't know if you ever heard of the poet, Mary Carr. She's written a bunch of memoirs. And she became, uh, she converted to faith. She went from being an atheist to becoming a person of faith. She was, she was uh, in, actually was baptized into the Catholic Church. She was talking about her uh, conversion. And she said what happened was the first thing that happened for her in order to her to become a, a believer in God and, and to confess faith in Jesus, the first thing she said that had to happen was she had to learn that just because she thinks it doesn't mean it's true. Just because it went through her mind it doesn't mean it's real. She said that she had to be humbled in that way. And part of how she learned it, she said, was by wrestling with addiction. Because if you ever fought against addiction or you've ever uh, fought, tried to change something hard in your life, you know that your brain has a million ways to argue you back into trouble when you want to get out of it. Have you ever noticed that? Your brain is not just telling you the truth all the time. Sometimes your brain is telling you to do things that you actively don't want to and you have to fight against your own mind, your own internal monologue. In fact, uh, it is not just fighting against addiction or trying to make a change, but 
Uh, even just if we want to really be quiet, have you ever gotten quiet and you just want to sit somewhere and you finally are able to tune out all the noise and maybe you even turn off your phone? Have you ever found that you just instantly sink into internal peace and quiet with your divine self? Or have you noticed that you can shut out all the other noise and your internal life can still be a whole mess? You know, um, I think when, when I look inside myself and from talking to others, I find this as well. I, I find things that are, that are helpful to reflect on and there's truth. It's not that this is all bad, but you know what I also find? Here's what I think a lot of our inner life is like. Our inner selves are like a cramped house sometimes with all the windows shut and we're kind of hoarders. There's stuff on every counter. And if you sit in that little house and you get clamped up into that, uh, you can rummage through all the same anxieties and obsessions and desires. And so you start thinking about what I have to do today and that thing I still regret from 15 years ago. Oh, I forgot. I didn't think that was here. And uh, the stuff I saw on Instagram and, oh, there's that thing that I really want. Oh, and my anxiety about that conversation I'm going to have today. And all of that is swirling around. And here's what worship says. It says, don't look in here to figure out what's going on. Jesus says, I want to come in and throw the doors open open on, the, on this cramped world of yours, and I want to bring you out into the fresh air of a bigger perspective of who I am, of what my truth is, of my glory. Don't stay wandering around in there. Come outside and look around at who God is and what he has said and what he has done and what he has promised. That's worship. God's revelation of who he is, which helps us, which helps us. To come out of ourselves and say, that's true even though I don't feel like it. That's true about who God is and about who I am, even though I forget it so often. God just changes the subject. And so this is the simple structure of worship, but it's profound. It's God reveals his glory and we respond in worship. So how do we respond? And just go back to this, the scope, the second one, the scope of worship. It's got this simple structure, but what we see in chapter 4 is that worship itself has this staggering scope. It really includes everything because as God reveals his glory, uh, the glory of God is such that it calls us into worship, not just in, listen, worship is not three songs. When you begin to see the revelation of who God is, it's actually a glory that permeates and fills everything. So all of life becomes worship. Uh, let me just show you some of his glory in this chapter. What this chapter is attempting to show us is, is, is by the, God's Spirit showing us about who God is. Uh, what is this glory of God that's revealed? Some of it, the first thing that's revealed is his, the, the glory of his beauty and splendor. Did you notice that? Um, this, these words, when, when John comes up and comes into the throne room of heaven, he's very, he's very uh, reticent to say much about the one on the throne. Did you notice that? He says, it, uh, it was in the spirit, verse 2, and there was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Uh, the, the testimony of the scripture throughout is you can't see God. No one has ever seen God. But what he sees is someone sitting on it. There is a throne. There is someone in charge. What he sees... Uh, is, is beauty. He's, you can see him struggling to describe the beauty of the light around God. Uh, the one had the appearance of jasper and ruby, uh, these jewels that catch and reflect light in color, right? There's a rainbow that encircles the throne, strangest rainbow you've ever seen. It goes all the way around. Have you ever seen a very vivid rainbow? Uh, it just kind of it's, just stops you for a moment. Here's a rainbow encircling him. And then surrounding the throne, there's these other thrones. And then from the throne, verse 5, came flashes of lightning. Uh, just a couple of nights ago, uh, Keith Lawrence, who's a new member of the church, said, I want to take you fishing. So he took me out on uh, Mesolonsky. And we went out, and we had a very short fishing trip because we looked across the lake and saw it getting very dark. And he had an aluminum boat. So he said, I think we should go back. I said, yes, yes, I think we should. But have you seen storms? I mean, you've seen it, right? Storms coming in. The massive size of thunderclouds, the flashing of lightning, and the sound when you're right under a thunder. Boom. This is, you see, these, here's what's happening here. You notice his language. He's constantly saying it was like emerald. It was like, 
John is trying to paint. He's not giving you a scientific uh, picture of what God's beauty is like. He's trying to put into words what the experience was like of getting a glimpse of the glorious beauty of God. He's trying to describe something that is so beautiful you can't capture it. Have you ever been, Sam and I climbed Katahdin. I, I said, I fell off of the knife's edge. God saved me. It was good. But when we were climbing up, we were climbing up, and Sam said, he looked out, and we tried to take pictures on our phone. And if you've done this, right? You've been out somewhere, and you look, and you say, this is amazing. And you take a picture, and you look at the little square, even with our great phones. And you say, this, what? that's not this, right? It's too big to capture. The glory of God's beauty is too big to put into words. What John is attempting to do is to tell you, friends, God in his glory is more beautiful than anything you can put words to. He's more grand. He's more big. The biggest things you see in creation are just a, a reflection of the beauty and glory of God. And how could it be otherwise? When we look at the mountains and the ocean and the thunderclouds, the one who made that is not boring and plain. And you see, this is the glory. Now listen, this is what we're saying. What's the scope of worship? When God reveals his glory, it is the glory of his beauty. That, you know that's why we sing. That's why Christians, whenever they gather, sing. Because singing is one of the most basic ways that all of us, even those of us with no musical ability, can do something beautiful and poetic, something that's more than rationality. You, you sing, music touches your heart, doesn't it? It moves your emotions. It's beautiful. We sing. Thank God I was reminded tonight of Brendan's playing. Amen? He's beautifully. And, and there's something wonderful. There's something fitting about coming before a God of this glory, a, a room like this. You can see the people who built this were aware of the beauty of God. They wanted to reflect it. Now, some of you have the ability to do these kinds of things, to make things beautiful, to have an eye for that, to make art, to make music. That's act of worship. The glory of God's beauty, the glory of his goodness. Uh, there's a throne and, you know, there's these 24 other thrones around it and then the four living creatures. And I think these are, again, symbolic of the, the authority of God, the, just the sweeping nature of the authority of God, his sovereignty. Uh, these 24 elders, I've already said, I think that these uh, are, are angelic beings, some kind of angelic representation of the angelic host. So you say, okay, fair enough. So what are those four creatures? Uh, did you, th th here they are, they're in the center around the throne, four living creatures. They were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion and the second was like an ox and the third had a face like a man and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Notice again, do you see the limits of language being pushed? Like, it's not an eagle, but it was like an eagle. <laughs> it had a face like a man. What, what is this? Uh, I believe in the context of Revelation, these are symbols not only of, of, of real creatures, these are symbols of all of creation. In numbers are significant in Revelation. And in Revelation, it talks about often the number four is associated with the whole earth. So you've heard of the four corners of the earth? That comes from Revelation. The four corners of the earth means the whole thing. There are only four corners. All four corners are represented. So you have four living creatures that come from the four, that, that kind of stand in these four corners of the earth, and they represent creation in all of its awesome beauty. Uh, some of the most in classical uh, thought, some of the most amazing, and even in our thought today, uh, animals. A lion. Think about a lion. An ox. Strong beast. Uh, uh, an eagle. And then a human. Face like a man. And here are all these spiritual hosts, and here are these representatives of all of creation, animals, and all of the globe, and human beings. And what is all of it doing? It's all around the one throne, one Lord. And it's worshiping. But here's what I said. It's not just the glory of God's beauty. It's the glory of his goodness. Because God is not just revealed here. 
as being powerful on a throne as if might makes right purely. But what is revealed about God's power is not only that he is the sovereign Lord of all, but that he is deeply and profoundly good. So what do they sing about him? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. If you want to emphasize something, if you want to say very holy, if you want to say wicked holy, which is a confusing phrase, but it kind of works in New England, wicked holy, the way you do it is by repeating it. So you say holy, holy means very holy. There's only a few places in the Bible, Isaiah 6 and here, where a word is repeated three times. Uh, Alec Motyer, who's an Old Testament commentator, says it's creating like a super superlative. It's like very, very, very wicked holy. That's what he's saying. In other words, what is great about God, the glory of God, is not just that he's powerful like Thor, it's that he is good. There is nothing to fear in him. There's no shadow side to him. There's no darkness in the back. There's no skeletons in his closet. From beginning to end, he's holy and good, and his authority, his power is exercised as one who is good from beginning to end. Very good. And what does that lead? You worship. One who is not only beautiful in what he makes as a God of beauty, but as a God of goodness, deep, profound goodness. And so you know God in his beauty, and you want to make things beautiful in reflection of him. And when you know God in his goodness, you do what the elders did. Did you notice what they do? When, when the four living creatures say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the four, the 24 elders who are sitting on their own thrones with their own crowns throw themselves off their thrones and they take off their crowns and they throw them before the throne of the one God. Because when God is that good, the only response is to say, God, command me. Tell me what to do. Let me be holy like you are holy. Let me be good in some small way, increasingly, like you are so deeply good. That's worship. You see the scope of it. This is so much more than three songs. Let me show you one more thing, last thing. You see the scope of, of worship. It's not only the glory of God's beauty and the glory of God's goodness, but also the glory of God's truth. Uh, the, throughout, I've said there's this revelation and then response. Words are communicated. Truth is communicated. And then there's a response. And the last, the last verse of this text, the elders cry out. Look at it with me. And at verse 11, they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for. Now I want you to notice that word, for. I want you to see what they're doing. They're not just saying, God, you're worthy of our worship. They're thinking it through and they're going to give a reason why God is worthy. You know what this is? Truth. You know what Jesus said? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. The truth of God. He says, look, they say, you are worthy. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they were created, and they have their being. Uh, I've heard it said, Jesus came to save us from our sins, not to save us from our brains. They're, good. They're meant to be used. Listen, and, and isn't it interesting, they look at all of creation and say, look at the splendor of God. Let me give you four quotes that you may not know or you may not have heard before. Maybe, have you heard of Copernicus? Listen to Copernicus. To know the mighty works of God, to comprehend the wonderful workings of his laws, surely all this must be pleasing and acceptable mode of worship to the Most High. In other words, Copernicus says doing science is worship. Okay, Galileo. You heard of Galileo? The glory and greatness of Almighty God are marvelously discerned. It's using his mind in all of his works. How about Kepler? You heard of Kepler? Geometry is unique and eternal. I'll, I'll trust him with that. Not good at geometry. Myself. Geometry is unique and eternal. A reflection, he says, of the mind of God. 
That men are able to participate in geometry, this reflection of the mind of God, is one of the reasons why man is the image of God. One more. Newton. You heard of Isaac Newton? The apple hit his head on the tree, right? Newton says, this most beautiful system of the sun and the planets and the comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent, powerful being. The glory of God's truth shown in the laws that govern this incredible world, the the reason that constructed the universe, that that guides the harmony of the planets, that this is worship for, for you are worthy of honor, for you created all things, and for you all things exist, and in you all things have their being, thinking and doing science to those of you who are good at that is worship rightly understood. All truth is God's truth. You see the scope? This is not, here's the the basic, basic structure, simple structure. God reveals we respond in worship. So what is the scope of that worship? It's, It's all of your heart. It's all of your soul. It's all of your emotion. It's all of your affection. It's all of your mind. It's all of your strength as you seek to do good in his name. It's all given to God. And here's, to paraphrase the church father, Irenaeus. Irenaeus said, the glory of God, he said something like this. I'm changing it. The glory of God is displayed in a human being who is fully alive. Alive to the beauty of the world and sees in that the hand of God and gives thanks. And alive to the wonder of the world and wants to discern it. And alive to the goodness of living for God. That's what it means to worship. It's all of life. Okay, here's this wonderful image of worship, last thing, shortest. This is a simple structure. God reveals, we respond, this tremendous scope. It's all of life because of the incredible glory of God. And the last thing it shows us is about God, this worship's sustaining power. Now, worship's sustaining power. Uh, this weekend... A whole bunch of people are going to work really hard to cover a lot of distance, swimming, running, and biking. And the only way you do that, I would assume, having never done it myself, is with some kind of a vision ahead of you that motivates you. You, you don't train uh, for as long as these people have trained without a vision of this weekend. They're looking forward to it. They're looking at the point when they're going to go. And once they're running and swimming and biking, I imagine a lot of them are going to have a vision in their mind, the finish line, what it's going to feel like when they're done, right? And and what worship does, why Jesus, remember our first question, if you had somebody who was going to go through something hard and you had to talk to them about something that would sustain them and show them through, and Jesus says, listen, church, you're going to go through some hard times and what you need What you need is not only to understand worship, you need to worship so that you have the sustaining vision of where the God you came from and the God you are heading toward. The glory of the God who is worth holding on to even when everything is against you. The God who is worth clinging to even when it feels hard, even when it is hard. Because what you see is not just the hard things, but look up. Look at God. Look at who he is and where you come from and look at where you're going. The sustaining power comes from a vision of God and his ruling glorious power and all of his beauty and his goodness and his truth that calls us to want to follow him. But ultimately, the ultimate sustaining power of worship comes not just from the vision of God's glory, the, the, the longing to strive to live these kind of glorious lives. I mean, this is, what's, this is worth your whole life, to worship God with your whole life. It's worth it. But the ultimate sustaining power comes not just from a vision of God's glory, but from a vision of God's redemption. Chapters 4 and chapters 5 really go together, chapter 4 and 5. I'm separating them for all of our sake, one at a time. But they go together, and the the, the vision moves from just the vision on the throne to this stunning turn that we'll look at next time we're together in this text. It's in verse 6 of chapter 5, if you have it open. When John looks next at the throne, 
he sees this. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. <laughs> what you need is a vision not just of the glory of God, but of the redeeming power of God, of the sacrificial love of God, of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the sacrificial Lamb, who was sacrificed for his people, for people like me, who, as Romans says, fell short of the glory of God this week, who have fallen short of living every moment in light of the awareness of who God is, who have fallen short of God's mercy and grace and dedicating our, his, our beautiful works toward him and thinking his thoughts. People who weren't that beautiful and not that good and not that holy and turned away to follow their own desires, the lamb was slain for fallen, broken, rebellious humanity like you and like me, which means in order to sustain, to keep going, you need not just a picture of God's glory, but you need a picture of God's glorious mercy. You need a picture of the cross. You need a picture of the Lamb of God who came down seeking you and shed his blood in order, in order by his grace and mercy to make you glorious when you could not do it yourself. A God of not only glory, but of grace so that when you fall down and when you're frail and when you're weak and when you look at the glory of God and you think, I, this is a hopeless cause, I'm never going to make it there, I, you look and you see that this God is not only the God of unapproachable light, but the God who is a lamb looking as he's slain, who came looking for the lost in order to bring them into his kingdom. Jesus, who opens the door into heaven and says, come here. That's how it starts. Come here. Come in. There are glorious things to see, and there's glory in what I'm going to do. Here is worship. May God give us the ability to see and to understand these things and to apply them in our lives. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Ask the Holy Spirit to apply his word just in quiet for a moment.